The history of the Jews in Lithuania spans the period from the 8th century to the present day. There is still a small community in that country, as well as an extensive Lithuanian Jewish diaspora in Israel, the United States and other countries. For more detail, see Lithuanian Jews. Early History As early as the 8th century Jews lived in parts of the Lithuanian territory. Beginning with that period they conducted trade between Russia, Lithuania, and the Baltic, especially Jomsburg, and other cities on the Vistula, Oder, and Elbe. The origin of the Jews of Lithuania has been the subject of much speculation. It is believed that they were made up of two distinct streams of Jewish immigration. The older and significantly smaller of the two entered the territory that would later become the Grand Duchy of Lithuania from the east. These early immigrants spoke Judeo-Slavic dialects which distinguished him from the later Jewish immigrants who entered the region from the Germanic lands. While the origin of these Eastern Jews is not certain, historical evidence places Jewish refugees from Babylonia, Palestine, the Byzantine Empire and other Jewish refugees and settlers in the lands between the Baltic and Black Seas that would become part of the Grand Duchy of Lithuania. The later and much larger stream of immigration originated in the 12th century and received an impetus from the persecution of the German Jews by the Crusaders. The traditional language of the vast majority of Jews of Lithuania, Yiddish, is based largely upon the medieval German spoken by the Western Germanic Jewish immigrants. The peculiar conditions that prevailed in Lithuania compelled the first Jewish settlers to adopt a different mode of life from that followed by their Western co-religionists. In the Lithuania of that day there were no cities in the Western sense of the word, no Magdeburg rites or close guilds. Increasing prosperity in the Great Charter with the campaign of Gediminas and his subjugation of Kiev and Volhynia the Jewish inhabitants of these territories were induced to spread throughout the northern provinces of the Grand Duchy of Lithuania. The probable importance of the southern Jews in the development of Lithuania is indicated by their numerical prominence in Volhynia in the 13th century. According to an analyst who describes the funeral of the Grand Duke Vladimir Vasilkovich in the city of Vladimir, the Jews wept at his funeral as at the fall of Jerusalem, or when being led into the Babylonian captivity, this sympathy and the record thereof would seem to indicate that long before the event in question, the Jews had enjoyed considerable prosperity and influence and this gave them a certain standing under the new regime. They took an active part in the development of the new cities under the tolerant rule of Gediminas. Little is known of the fortunes of the Jews of Lithuania during the troubled times that followed the death of Gediminas and the accession of his grandson Vytautas. To the latter, the Jews owed a charter of privileges which was momentous in the subsequent history of the Jews of Lithuania. The documents granting privileges first to the Jews of Brest and later to those of Trakai, Grodno, Lusk, Vladimir, and other large towns are the earliest documents to recognize the Jews of Lithuania as possessing a distinct organization. The gathering together of the scattered Jewish settlers in sufficient numbers and with enough power to form such an organization and to obtain privileges from their Lithuanian rulers implies the lapse of considerable time. The Jews who dwelt in smaller towns and villages were not in need of such privileges at this time, as Abraham Harkavy suggests, and the mode of life, the comparative poverty, and the ignorance of Jewish learning among the Lithuanian Jews hindered their intercommunal organization. But powerful forces hastened this organization toward the close of the 14th century. The chief of these was probably the cooperation of the Jews of Poland with the Jews of Lithuania. After the death of Casimir III, the condition of the Polish Jews changed for the worse. The influence of the Roman Catholic clergy at the Polish court grew. Louis of Anjou was indifferent to the welfare of his subjects and his eagerness to convert the Jews to Christianity, together with the increased Jewish immigration from Germany, 
cause the Polish Jews to become apprehensive for their future. The Charter of 1388 on this account it seems more than likely that influential Polish Jews cooperated with the leading Lithuanian communities in securing a special charter from Vytautas. The preamble of the charter reads as follows. In the name of God, Amen. All deeds of men, when they are not made known by the testimony of witnesses or in writing, pass away and vanish and are forgotten. Therefore, we, Alexander, also called Vytautas, by the grace of God, Grand Duke of Lithuania and ruler of Brest, Dorogic, Lusk, Vladimir, and other places, make known by this charter to the present and future generations, or to whomever it may concern to know or hear of it, that, after due deliberation with our nobles we have decided to grant to all the Jews living in our domains the rights and liberties mentioned in the following charter. Under the charter, the Lithuanian Jews formed a class of freemen subject in all criminal cases directly to the jurisdiction of the Grand Duke and his official representatives and in petty suits to the jurisdiction of local officials on an equal footing with the lesser nobles, boyars, and other free citizens. The official representatives of the Polish king and the Grand Duke were the voivode in Poland and the elder in Lithuania, who were known as the Jewish judges, and their deputies. The Jewish judge decided all cases between Christians and Jews and all criminal suits in which Jews were concerned in civil suits. However, he acted only on the application of the interested parties. Either party who failed to obey the judge's summons had to pay him a fine. To him also belonged all fines collected from Jews for minor offences. His duties included the guardianship of the persons, property, and freedom of worship of the Jews. He had no right to summon anyone to his court except upon the complaint of an interested party. In matters of religion the Jews were given extensive autonomy. Under these equitable laws the Jews of Lithuania reached a degree of prosperity unknown to their Polish and German co-religionists at that time. The communities of Brest, Grodno, Trakai, Lusk, and Minsk rapidly grew in wealth and influence. Every community had at its head a Jewish elder. These elders represented the communities in all external relations, in securing new privileges, and in the regulation of taxes. Such officials are not, however, referred to by the title elder before the end of the 16th century. Up to that time the documents merely state, for instance, that the Jews of Brest humbly apply, etc. On assuming office the elders declared under oath that they would discharge the duties of the position faithfully, and would relinquish the office at the expiration of the appointed term. The elder acted in conjunction with the rabbi, whose jurisdiction included all Jewish affairs with the exception of judicial cases assigned to the court of the deputy, and by the latter to the king. In religious affairs, however, an appeal from the decision of the rabbi and the elder was permitted only to a council consisting of the chief rabbis of the king's cities. The cantor, sexton, and shoshe were subject to the orders of the rabbi and elder. The goodwill and tolerance of Itautas endeared him to his Jewish subjects, and for a long time traditions concerning his generosity and nobility of character were current among them. His cousin, the king of Poland Jogaila, did not interfere with his administration during Vytautas' lifetime. Jagiellon rule. In 1569, Poland and Lithuania were united. It was generally a time of prosperity and relative safety for the Jews of both countries. However, a few events, such as the expulsion of the Jews from the Grand Duchy of Lithuania between 1495 and 1503 occurred just within Lithuania. Expulsion of the Jews in 1495 and return in 1503 Casimir was succeeded as King of Poland by his son John Albert, and on the Lithuanian throne by his younger son, Alexander Jagiellon. The latter confirmed the charter of privileges granted to the Jews by his predecessors, and even gave them additional rights. His father's Jewish creditors received part of the sums due to them, the rest being withheld under various pretexts. 
the favorable attitude toward the Jews which had characterized the Lithuanian rulers for generations was unexpectedly and radically changed by a decree promulgated by Alexander in April 1495. By this decree all Jews living in Lithuania proper and the adjacent territories were summarily ordered to leave the country. The expulsion was evidently not accompanied by the usual cruelties, for there was no popular animosity toward the Lithuanian Jews, and the decree was regarded as an act of mere willfulness on the part of an absolute ruler. Some of the nobility, however, approved Alexander's decree, expecting to profit by the departure of their Jewish creditors as is indicated by numerous lawsuits on the return of the exiles to Lithuania in 1503. It is known from the Hebrew sources that some of the exiles migrated to the Crimea, and that by far the greater number settled in Poland, where, by permission of King John Albert, they established themselves in the towns situated near the Lithuanian boundary. This permission, given at first for a period of two years, was extended because of the extreme poverty of the Jews on account of the great losses sustained by them. The extension, which applied to all the towns of the kingdom, accorded the enjoyment of all the liberties that had been granted to their Polish brethren. The expelled Karaites settled in the Polish town of Ratno. The causes of the unexpected expulsion were probably many, including religious reasons the need to fill a depleted treasury by confiscating the Jews' money, personal animosity, and other causes. Soon after Alexander's accession to the throne of Poland he permitted the Jewish exiles to return to Lithuania. Beginning in March 1503, as is shown by documents still extant, their houses, lands, synagogues, and cemeteries were returned to them, and permission was granted them to collect their old debts. The new Charter of Privileges permitted them to live throughout Lithuania as before. The return of the Jews and their attempt to regain their old possessions led to many difficulties and lawsuits. Alexander found it necessary to issue an additional decree, directing his vice-regent to enforce the law. In spite of this some of the property was not recovered by the Jews for years. The Act of 1566 at the same time, the middle of the 16th century witnessed a growing antagonism between the lesser nobility and the Jews. Their relations became strained, and the enmity of the Christians began to disturb the life of the Lithuanian Jews. The anti-Jewish feeling, due at first to economic causes engendered by competition, was fostered by the clergy who were then engaged in a crusade against heretics, notably the Lutherans, Calvinists, and Jews. The Reformation, which had spread from Germany, tended to weaken the allegiance to the Roman Catholic Church. Frequent instances occurred of the marriage of Catholic women to Jews, Turks, or Tartars. The Bishop of Vilna complained to Sigismund August of the frequency of such mixed marriages and of the education of the offspring in their father's faiths. The Schliachter also saw in the Jews dangerous competitors in commercial and financial undertakings. In their dealings with the agricultural classes the lords preferred the Jews as middlemen, thus creating a feeling of injury on the part of the Schliachter. The exemption of the Jews from military service and the power and wealth of the Jewish tax farmers intensified the resentment of the Schliachter. Members of the nobility, like Borzar Bargati, Zagorovsky, and others, attempted to compete with the Jews as leaseholders of customs revenues, but were never successful. Since the Jews lived in the towns and on the lands of the king, the nobility could not wield any authority over them nor derive profit from them. They had not even the right to settle Jews on their estates without the permission of the king, but, on the other hand, they were often annoyed by the erection on their estates of the toll houses of the Jewish tax collectors. Hence when the favorable moment arrived, the Lithuanian nobility endeavored to secure greater power over the Jews. At the Diet of Vilna in 1551 the nobility urged the imposition of a special poll tax of one ducat per head, and the Volhynian nobles demanded that the Jewish tax collectors be forbidden to erect toll houses or place guards at the taverns on their estates. 
The opposition to the Jews was finally crystallized and found definite expression in the repressive Lithuanian Statute of 1566, when the Lithuanian nobles were first allowed to take part in the national legislation. Paragraph 12 of this statute contains the following articles. The Jews shall not wear costly clothing, nor gold chains, nor shall their wives wear gold or silver ornaments. The Jews shall not have silver mountings on their sabers and daggers. They shall be distinguished by characteristic clothes. They shall wear yellow caps, and their wives kerchiefs of yellow linen, in order that all may be enabled to distinguish Jews from Christians. Other restrictions of a similar nature are contained in the same paragraph. However, the king checked the desire of the nobility to modify essentially the old charters of the Jews. In the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, effect of the Cossacks uprising in Lithuania, the fury of this uprising destroyed the organization of the Lithuanian Jewish communities. The survivors who returned to their old homes in the latter half of the 17th century were practically destitute. The wars which raged constantly in the Lithuanian territory brought ruin to the entire country and deprived the Jews of the opportunity to earn more than a bare livelihood. The intensity of their struggle for existence left them no time to re-establish the conditions which had existed up to 1648. John Casimir sought to ameliorate their condition by granting various concessions to the Jewish communities of Lithuania. Attempts to return to the old order in the communal organization were not wanting, as is evident from contemporary documents. Thus in 1672, Jewish elders from various towns and villages in the Grand Duchy of Lithuania secured a charter from King Michael Wisniawiki decreeing that on account of the increasing number of Jews guilty of offences against the Schliachter and other Christians, which result in the enmity of the Christians toward the Jews, and because of the inability of the Jewish elders to punish such offenders, who are protected by the lords, the king permits the Cahals to summon the criminals before the Jewish courts for punishment and exclusion from the community when necessary. The efforts to resurrect the old power of the Cahals were not successful. The impoverished Jewish merchants, having no capital of their own, were compelled to borrow money from the nobility, from churches, congregations, monasteries, and various religious orders. Loans from the latter were usually for an unlimited period and were secured by mortgages on the real estate of the Cahal. The Cahals thus became hopelessly indebted to the clergy and the nobility. In 1792 the Jewish population of Lithuania was estimated at 250,000. The whole of the commerce and industries of Lithuania, now rapidly declining, was in the hands of the Jews. The nobility lived for the most part on their estates and farms, some of which were managed by Jewish leaseholders. The city properties were concentrated in the possession of monasteries, churches, and the lesser nobility. The Christian merchants were poor. Such was the condition of affairs in Lithuania at the time of the Second Partition of Poland, when the Jews became subjects of Russia. The history of the Jews in Lithuania spans the period from the 8th century to the present day. There is still a small community in that country, as well as an extensive Lithuanian Jewish diaspora in Israel, the United States and other countries. For more detail, see Lithuanian Jews. Early History As early as the 8th century Jews lived in parts of the Lithuanian territory. Beginning with that period they conducted trade between Russia, Lithuania, and the Baltic, especially Jomsborg, and othered, throughout the northern provinces of the Grand Duchy of Lithuania. The probable importance of the southern Jews in the development of Lithuania is indicated by their numerical prominence in Volhynia in the 13th century. According to an analyst who describes the funeral of the Grand Duke Vladimir Vasilkovich in the city of Vladimir, the Jews wept at his funeral as at the fall of Jerusalem. 
or when being led into the Babylonian captivity, this sympathy and the record thereof would seem to indicate that long before the event in Quesites on the Vistula, Oda, and Elbe, the origin of the Jews of Lithuania has been the subject of much speculation. It is believed that they were made up of two distinct streams of Jewish immigration. The older and significantly smaller of the two entered the territory that would later become the Grand Duchy of Lithuania from the east. These early immigrants spoke Judeo-Slavic dialects which distinguished him from the later Jewish immigrants who entered the region from the Germanic lands. While the origin of these Eastern Jews is not civil German spoken by the Western Germanic Jewish immigrants, the peculiar conditions that prevailed in Lithuania compelled the first Jewish settlers to adopt a different mode of life from that followed by their Western co-religionists. In the Lithuania of that day there were no cities in the Western sense of the word, no Magdeburg rights or close guilds. Increasing prosperity in the Great Charter, with the campaign of Gediminas and his subjugation of Kiev and Volhynia the Jewish inhabitants of these territories were induced to spread and historical evidence places Jewish refugees from Babylonia, Palestine the Byzantine Empire and other Jewish refugees and settlers in the lands between the Baltic and Black Seas that would become part of the Grand Duchy of Lithuania. The later and much larger stream of immigration originated in the 12th century and received an impetus from the persecution of the German Jews by the Crusaders. The traditional language of the vast majority of Jews of Lithuania, Yiddish, is based largely upon the medieval